Powers, Claire, is it Graven? Graven. Yes, Claire Graven, and Jennifer Kuntz, Kuntz who goes by Jen. She introduced herself as Jen. So I'm always very sensitive to, to, that, to Jen Kuntz. And, um, and of course, I'm, a, I'm partial to JFNCS just because um, I had the, the honor of actually lobbying on behalf of this organization a number of years ago, 17 to like 20 years ago, wow. up at the state capitol and also on the federal level. And you'll hear from this group, um, I always said to elected officials, JFNCS is like Lutheran Social Service or Catholic Charities. They serve Jew and non-Jew alike. It's not just for Jewish people. Um, they provide f uh, fantastic services. And um, they're not going to say this because they're very modest people, but JFNCS really, in my mind, is like the flagship of the Jewish community here, in not just in the Twin City, not just in Minneapolis, not just in Golden Valley, not just Minnesota, but really the upper northwest, midwest of the country. Uh, they really are seen as a leader on the national level for other Jewish family service organizations around the um, around the country. So we are very lucky to have such um, an esteemed organization, successful, effective organization here in our neighborhood. So um, just a little bit about Dana. As you see up here, she's the Community and Volunteer Engagement Manager at JFNCS. Uh, wearing lots of hats, but her current role is working with volunteers and promoting JFNCS in the community. And for 13 and a half years, she's been at JFNCS um, doing things like development, uh, working in career services, doing intake and resource connection, and community services. Uh, Claire Graven is a case manager in senior services at JFNCS. In that role, she helps clients and families connect with resources they need to live the best lives that they want to live. Previously, Claire worked at JFNCS in food security, helping people access food resources and benefits. And last but not least is Jen Kuntz, who is also a case manager in senior services. In that position, she's working with senior clients and their families to establish goals and locate resources and establish a variety of services so that the clients can stay independent and thrive. Prior to that, uh, Jim worked as an academic coach at Capella University, so if anyone's looking for any higher education opportunities, uh, talk to Jen. Um, she also worked at Goodwill Easter Seals, removing barriers and coordinating job skills training for people so they could be prepared when they go to work. So uh, with that, please help me introduce our guest from JFNCS. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. As Shep said, I am Dana Shapiro. Um, so you heard a little intro on me. Um, I'm sorry I don't come with chocolates, but I do come with these free squishy balls that are um, have our brand on there, our logo. And so they're wonderful if you're stressed, and even if you're not stressed, um, they're, they're great. So please take one with you um, and keep us in mind. So. JFCS, so Jewish Family and Children's Service, or JFCS, we are, um, so Jen, Claire, and I are from the Minneapolis organization, and we are a social service agency that is part of a national network, as Shep said, and um, we've been around in Minneapolis locally for 113 years, actually, in Minneapolis before the United Way, um, and I will say we were started as an organization that could, um, that was just helping Jewish people, and the reason for that was because Jewish people were not able to be served at other organizations. Um, so fortunately, over the years, we've expanded quite a bit, um, and we're a very inclusive place. Um, we serve 13,000 people of all ages and background at all stages of life in the Jewish and broader communities, and our service area is really Hennepin County and some of the surrounding areas. There's also a Jewish family service in St. Paul, so they serve Ramsey County and some of those surrounding areas as well. So we have about 100 some staff at JFCS working full time and part time in the community. If you drive by our office, which is right on Golden Valley Road, just um, off of, actually if you come on Thursday, we're very close to that, um, but right on uh, Golden Valley Road, just off of Douglas Drive, very close to that, um, right in the same building as Prism, which many of you have been to. Um, so if you, if you come by on a weekday, you know, you may not see a lot of cars in the um, parking lot, but that's not to say we're not working 
working hard out in the community. Many of us are out in the community, you know, providing remote work and also um, many of our staff are at people's homes or coffee shops and really um, meeting with people and so so we're always there. It's just the, the type of care we've provided has been um, not just limited to the, the walls of our building. Um, we've also been in Golden Valley since 2018. Prior to that we were in Minnetonka and so we moved over here and really wanted to have partnership with a food shelf and so with our strong partnership with PRISM we're very fortunate for that we consider ourselves to be a one-stop shop and so we can help the community in multiple ways and we re recognize that you know both of our organizations we don't do everything and um, you know so when we aren't able to help someone, we do provide referrals in the community. So we are based on the Jewish value of tikkun olam, which is Hebrew for repairing the world, and that's really how many of us you know, do our work each day. So as far as volunteers, I get the um, pleasure of working with our volunteers, and last year we had 815 volunteers that were involved in a variety of ways. Um, many helped with short-term opportunities, so maybe a shift during our Hagsa Math program, um, but many are involved in long-term ways, uh, matched directly with our clients and helping at the front desk and um, you know serving on boards, and, uh, our board and committees in many ways. So as Shep said, um, we are grateful that Golden Valley Rotary Club has been involved in Hag Sameach, which is our holiday program. We serve um, Jewish people in the community um, who are in need, and so Jewish people don't have to be affiliated with the organization previously. Um, that said, we also serve our current clients who are in need of holiday gifts, and um, so they can be of any background. And something that's unique about our holiday gift program is that um, we provide gifts for the whole family, and many organizations are providing this service just to kids, and you know, everyone does what they can do, but that's something that sets us apart is we provide it for the whole community. And I will say that when I've been in that role of um, intake counselor, calling people and talking to them, um, taking in the referral and asking parents, you know, what would you like for the holidays this year for your kids? Um, we really try to customize the gifts as much as possible. And then it comes time to asking what are their interests and um, so many people I talked to said, wow, I haven't even thought about that. I've just been focusing on my other family members. So we're really um, pleased that we can help everyone. Um, and this time of year, we, we all know it goes a long way. Um, so I wanna draw your attention to these flyers I put on the tables. Um, so this is really my favorite flyer about JFCS. It says everything we do. Um, as you'll see on this side with the, all the colors, it's our service areas. So career services, community services and engagement, counseling and mental health services, education and learning, financial assistance and food security, and last but not least, senior services. And so all of the programs are listed with the hearts next to them. Our programs are evolving all the time to, um, to respond to community needs. Um, and so that is you know, one of the nice things is that we are, we are very innovative and always looking to um, adapt our services. So whether you need help, um, and many people have reached out for help for the first time in the last few years, um, as many as of us are aware of, um, you know, it's not easy to ask for help, but we really want people to know that we are here for you and your families and networks and friends. Um, so whether you need help, whether you want to volunteer, um, or whether you want to donate, or I will add all the above, <laughs> um, JFCS is here for all always. That's really our tagline. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. We tell people just call our main number, um, which I have listed on the slide, and you'll find it on the flyer. Um, you can also go to our website, which is jfcsmpls.org. Um, call our main number, and we'll let our receptionist take it from there, because oftentimes someone will reach out needing um, maybe a delivery of food from PRISM, from our neighbor next door, and as we talk to them, we also find out that they lost a job and they could use financial assistance and you know their parents are aging and could use senior services. So we're able to really provide that holistic approach to helping people, um, and I could go on and on about it, but I really want to um, stop there and just thank you so much for your time. I would like to hand the microphone over to my colleagues, Claire and Jen, and um, 
They're both case managers and senior services and are going to talk to you about Dementia Friends training and really what that means. Um, you know, they both, I know, have done a great job in kind of cutting this training short because, you know, it can go on even longer and maybe there's opportunities that you're affiliated with different groups that they can provide a Dementia Friends training for. Um, so I'm going to stop there and thank you so much for your time. Hi everybody, as, as Dana and Chef said, we're case managers in the Senior Services Department at JFCS. And so in that capacity, we work with people in the early stages of dementia and their family and friends who are caregivers. And our purpose in being here today is um, the Dementia Friends Program. And the goal is to help communities become more welcoming and inclusive for people who are living with dementia. And um, Jen and I both work with people uh, with dementia and we also have experience having a close family member, being a caregiver for a close family member with dementia. And we're not experts in dementia, but we're, we can answer questions uh, from our experience working with people, and we also know where to find other resources if you have questions about um, being supportive to someone who's living with dementia. And um, our goal in the very short time that we have is to help you come away with some key messages about dementia and also some communication tips about how to, how to communicate with someone with dementia. So if you look at the handouts on your table, there's a, a two-page handout, which is what we will be referring to in our comments. And before we get into that, let me just take a quick poll of the group. So, um, how many of you have known a friend or family member living with dementia? All of the hands go up. All right. And how many of you have been a caregiver, broadly defined, for a person with dementia? Thank you. Okay, Jeff. So I'd like to start off by asking the group what comes to mind, one word that comes to mind when you hear the word dementia. Does anyone want to share a word? Forgetful. Mm -hmm. Forgetful. Challenging. Challenging. Confusion. Confusion. Right. Helpless. Yeah, helpless. Um, many of these are negative, um, mostly, and that's very common. A lot of, we hear a lot of fear or loss sometimes. Um, but dementia is not, it's not a specific disease, it's an overall term that describes a wide range of symptoms associated with decline in memory or other thinking skills um, that are severe enough to really affect someone's daily life. And Alzheimer's is the most common, as we, we all know. Um, it accounts for 60 to 80 percent of cases, and that's what we'll be, we'll be using the term Alzheimer's as we um, talk about our uh, dementia friends program here. Um, so um, let's get into um, age-related cognitive decline versus normal aging. And we're going to touch on this a little bit. Um, this is listed on, uh, or we'll get into the early signs and symptoms next. Uh, but most of us know that there are physical changes as we age. We have to wear glasses, our hair grays, we're sore and maybe stiff in the morning. Um, as we get up. We also experience cognitive and thinking skills changes um, where we don't remember names as well as we, we once did or we sometimes get um, agitated or you know we have trouble concentrating in busy settings. That can be very normal. Um, but what is normal aging and what are maybe signs of something more serious? So we're going to dive into that a little bit. Um, your uh, participant packet does have, on page one, does have a listing of um, 10 signs and symptoms which the Alzheimer's Association has identified. We're not going to read through all of these, but I will highlight some of them for us. And um, the first sign is really um, a memory loss that disrupts daily life. 
So forgetting important dates or events, um, asking for the same information over and over, relying on memory aids um, consistently, or asking family members. Um, however, normal aging could be forgetting names or appointments sometimes, but we'll, we'll remember them later. We usually, that'll come to us later in the day perhaps. Um, another sign would be, uh, that to point out would be difficulty, um, which is the number three, difficulty completing familiar tasks at home. Now this is probably one of the first things you may have noticed or may or will notice about a family member or loved one um, is this one. Uh, you know, they may not be driving to the right location. Um, they may need help with bills. Um, they may have, they may, may remember, may not remember rules to their favorite card game, for example. So, um, versus normal aging, which could be um, needing help with figuring out, you know, the TV settings or streaming um, <laughs> challenges that uh, everyone has probably. <laughs> um, that's normal. Uh, highlighting a few other ones here uh, would be um, just dec dis decreased or poor judgment. So uh, they may, a person may need help remembering when to shower or change clothes. Um, they may be giving money to organizations, large amounts of money, which is, could be a very unusual for them. Um, but then you discover that. Whereas um, normal aging is making a bad decision just maybe once in a while. Everyone does that. Um, but also to point out uh, withdrawing from social or work activities, that can be an early sign or symptom that I wanted to point out. Um, you know, just forgetting how to do their favorite hobby or not keeping up with their favorite sports team, for example. Um, whereas normal aging could be just feeling not up to large gatherings anymore, not really um, kind of feeling wary of social obligations. Um, lastly here, I'll just point out the, um, the changes in mood and personality. Um, that can be, this is something that I think that's very common that we see um, is feeling, you, you have a person feeling confused, suspicious, fearful, um, they may easily get upset. Um, whereas uh, normal aging could be um, where we're really routine. You know, some of us are like me, we're very routine and when that's interrupted, that becomes bothersome, let's say. So that can be very, very normal. Um, so I wanted to put out a question. Has anyone experienced a sign or symptoms? Does anyone want to share an example that you've experienced or that someone that you know have experienced? <clears throat> Kind of the paranoia or the, we call it paranoia. Um, my mom had, had, is on oxygen and she had her oxygenator replaced with a new one because hers broke down and it's a different color. So she was convinced it wasn't the right one and that her physical was because her oxygen machine wasn't working. You know, I'm not that I'm 90 years old and barely sedentary, I'm short of breath because you gave me this cheaper oxygen to save money to pay for my to pay for my housing, you know, and just won't let it go. Just like for 30 days, it was, you know, 10 calls a day. When are you gonna get me back my oxygen machine? And it was the same machine with a different color case. Um, and why are you saving money on this? I need this, you know, to be healthy. And yeah. So the kind of the paranoia along with just the disconnect from mm -hmm. reality. Something that you notice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Claire is going to talk a little, thank you for sharing. Um, Claire's gonna talk a little bit about um, some of our key messages that we wanted to bring forth. There's a, there's a point I wanted to be sure to make um, in this presentation, uh, and it's just sort of, a, sort of a random fact to keep in mind about this conversation, which is that the Alzheimer's Association of Minnesota estimates that by 2025, there will be 120,000 people age 65 or older living with dementia here in Minnesota, which is an increase of 21% over 2020. And the other point that I wanted to make is that um, people with dementia, um, it progresses very slowly 
And it can be years before a person has a formal diagnosis of Alzheimer's or some other. So it can be, I believe the statistic is, up to seven years before a person has a formal diagnosis. And the reason I'm making the, those two points is that you may be encountering people in your work, in the community, in your volunteer work, where you may begin to think there, you know, there may be something going on here with this person. And so the information that we're giving you is tips on things to think about how you might interact with that person. You don't have to know that someone has a diagnosis for some of this information to be helpful in thinking about how am I going to approach this conversation or handle it. It doesn't seem to be going the way one would expect it to go. And so I wanted to be sure to get that in, um, both um, the increase and the fact that it's not necessarily likely that the person has a formal diagnosis. Um, so if you'll turn to page two of your handout, we're going to do a quick multiple choice test. <laughs> so question number one, dementia is not what? What is the answer? E, a normal part of aging. Um, you know, we may become more forgetful as Jen said, um, but dementia is a different type of forgetfulness. Memory loss may be more noticeable, but it can also be accompanied by mood changes and confusion. Okay, question number two. Dementia is caused by? A. A, diseases of the brain. So Alzheimer's is the most common, and the thing that it, I think is important to understand is that <coughs> Alzheimer's is <coughs> changing the chemistry and structure of the brain, and it's causing brain cells to die. Um, and so it can affect memory, but it can also affect people's ability to speak, think, communicate, um, and it interferes with structured tasks like writing. So you think about, you know, sequential tasks, something as simple as following a recipe. You know, suddenly someone you know well can't, can't follow a recipe to do something they've always done that may be an indication that something's going on. Okay, question number three. Dementia is not just having memory problems. It can make it harder to plan, etc. cetera. Um, question number four. It's possible to have a C. good quality of life with dementia. And particularly if the person has the right support and know-how it's, pers it's possible to have a good quality of life. As I said, it can be years before a person has a diagnosis, but if you can provide the right support and people around them who understand what's happening, they can have a good quality of life for years. And then question number five, there's more to the person than? The yes, than the dementia. You, just in the same way that a person may have cancer or diabetes, there's more to that person than the dementia. And then I want to touch on the bookcase on page three of your handout. And this is the concept that I wish I had understood better when I was a caregiver for my mother who had Alzheimer's. This is what it would have been really helpful for me to understand. And so if you think of this bookcase as a 70-year-old woman who has dementia, and there's a full bookcase beside her, and each book in the bookcase represents one of her skills or memories, the books on the top shelves are the first ones to go. And those are the, the skills around math and language and keeping behavior in check. Um, and so the person may not remember what they had for breakfast or what she paid at the drugstore, someone who came to visit her. So those, those, what, the skills that come from the frontal cortex of your brain, the planning skills, the math skills, the writing skills, um, those are the first to go. The ones that, the ones, and the thing that I would want people to understand is they're gone. And no amount of saying, remember mom, the time, blah, blah, blah. No, it is gone. 
and your, your prompting is um, frustrating for both of you. It may make her feel sad, him or her. And so the, the concept that those brain cells have been killed off, those books are gone. The books that remain the longest um, are the ones on the lower shelves, which are um, emotions of love and comfort, support, um, and while they may forget names, faces, and dates, they remember that you're family, that you love them, they, they hear how you talk to them, how you interact with them, how they feel. Do they feel loved? Do they feel safe and comfortable when you're with them? That's what, that's what remains to the end, in my experience. That's what remains. And this is what I think it's so important to understand. Um, that person's still there. The music she loved is still there. Um, and they hear. They hear your voice. They hear your tone. They know if they're being treated with respect. So the names, places, dates, that's forgotten. But the, so for example, my mother remembered her affection for her youngest brother. She didn't remember that he had recently passed away. And I don't think it would have been particularly a kindness to remind her of that fact. She remembered him with affection. So I'll hand it back to Jim. So we're going to talk a little bit about communication. And as Claire mentioned uh, in the bouquet story, um, we talked about how a person might feel as the changes of dementia continue, continue to affect thinking. And one of the skills that may be greatly affected is the ability to communicate both expression, expressing needs and really comprehending what someone's saying to them. So as we talk about communication, keep in mind how the person may feel. Um, changes in the ability to communicate are unique to everyone, of course. Everyone with, with Alzheimer's is different, has a different experience. Um, they may use familiar words repeatedly. Um, they may invent new words uh, to describe familiar objects. Um, they lose their train of thought. Um, they revert to their first language, which um, I've experienced with a client. Um, uh, that can be very common. It's more comfortable for them, it's easier to understand, and it uh, brings them back to a zone where they feel they feel themselves, perhaps. Um, having difficulty organizing logically. Um, but ongoing communication is important, um, no matter how difficult it may become, um, or how confused with a per a, the person with Alzheimer's appears. It's still important. Um, you may notice that the person is more easily confused and they may not respond to what you're saying or asking. Um, so they may um, respond by behaviors is what we've kind of we've experienced. So sometimes we call them behaviors, but often they're really a form of communication. So if someone is um, upset um, or if they push you away because she can't get, she doesn't want to lift her hands up to get a shirt on, it's painful for her, they may push away. Um, or if um, someone is, um, if everyone around the room is moving quickly or in a public setting, that may upset a person and the person might start crying because they are not sure how to handle that situation. So there's some tips on the last page, page four of the handout that we gave you that we're going to kind of dive into a little bit more um, on communicating with a person with dementia. So. Um, and I won't be reading them all, but um, I did want to touch on a few of them. Um, and they're, um, these are just great tips to just keep in mind, I think. Um, treating the person with dignity, respect, um, being patient and supportive, um, and, uh, and just to know that it takes time. It takes time to process. So just being aware. Um, being aware of your feelings. So if I have a um, if I'm irritated with someone, that may come across in my tone or my facial expressions. So, um, if someone is having trouble communicating, um, it's good to offer comfort and assurance. Um, we want to avoid criticizing or correcting. Um, argue, we want to avoid arguing. Um, uh, if, or offer a guest. If you offer a guest someone that's trying to tell you, I can't find my 
my hand clock. Where is my hand clock? And you think, oh, watch, okay. You're, you're talking about your watch, I understand. Um, and also communicate with nonverbal communication. That's also um, pointing or gesturing can be very, very helpful for someone. So those tips are listed there for you. Um, and then other tips as you have a conversation, um, again, listed there in conversation tips as you're kind of starting a conversation, um, just to touch on a few things, you know, approaching from the front, keeping good eye contact, calling them by their name, um, as we said, speaking very uh, clearly. Um, and then you'll see some other points here at the, uh, at the conversation tips. Um, as Claire said, avoid, um, you know, reminiscing. Perhaps that's not the best thing to do. It could cause um, more frustration. So um, the memory is, is not accessible any longer. Um, so these are some good points you can sort of keep in mind. Um, I do want to make sure we get to some of our resources and um, uh, other things here before we wrap up. But please, um, yeah, let us know if you think, and want to talk afterwards as well. So I just want to point out the resources that are on the back page of the handout. Um, the Alzheimer's Association of Minnesota is a terrific resource. They have online resources. They have support groups in person and online. They have a helpline you can call. Um, I would also mention JFCS. If you're dealing with a situation with a family member and may need some support, um, call our intake line, the number that Dana gave you. Tell the person what you're dealing with. They'll take the information and make the appropriate referral within the organization to get you to someone uh, perhaps like Jen and myself, perhaps in another department. And um, the Senior Linkage Line is a great resource for all kinds of issues for seniors. And I gave you a flyer on our Memory Cafe which is meets every other Wednesday. It's for people living with dementia and their caregivers. They get together, they, they spend some pleasant time doing activities together, and it's just a very supportive environment, both for people living with dementia and for their caregivers. So that's, that's us, that's the, that's the whirlwind tour of Dementia Friends Minnesota. So thank you for your